Aside from Bill Brennan, who is your Supreme Court hero? Oh, I would say that um, Holmes, Brandeis, and Jackson were the three who I most admired. Um, Holmes, because of his uh, opinions in uh, the Abrams case and uh, Gitlow, which really gave birth to the American tradition of free speech. Uh, Holmes was sometimes a, a great justice, sometimes not a great justice, but uh, he rose to the occasion after a very limping start uh, on, in these First Amendment cases and, and really has profoundly changed the nation in those opinions in the way in which he articulated the importance of free speech. Um, and Brandeis really for similar reasons. I mean, his concurring opinion in Whitney versus California um, is also, I think, one of the truly landmark opinions in the history of American law and uh, reinforced what Holmes had, had done in the First Amendment area. Uh, and Jackson, I think, primarily for me, for his opinion in West, West Virginia Board of Education v. Barnett. Um, Jackson was a, a, a great justice generally and a wonderful writer, uh, but Barnett was a truly remarkable decision. Uh, at the height of World War II for the Supreme Court to hold that it violated the First Amendment of the Constitution for the government to require school children to pledge allegiance to the flag was uh, an extraordinary uh, testament to the willingness of the court to place individual freedom over a kind of regimented patriotism. And Jackson's opinion in the case uh, is truly one of the most memorable and most eloquent that any justice has ever written. Um, and of course, his opinion in Korematsu uh, uh, was a great opinion, as was his opinion in the steel seizure case. Um, and Jackson had throughout his career a kind of integrity and character to the process. You, you always had the sense with Jackson that what you were getting was a mind at work. That uh, when you read his opinions, this was not written by a law clerk. Um, this was written by a person who was truly engaged in the problem presented. And the opinion was not simply an excuse for a result reached on other grounds. Um, he really let you into his head. And you felt that when you read Jackson's opinion, you understood why he felt the way he did. And that's not true for very many Supreme Court opinions. The vast majority of those opinions uh, more recently are written by law clerks and they have a bureaucratic feel to them. And they often have nothing to do with the real reasoning of the justice. Or even when they're written by the justice, they often tend to be good briefs for their position rather than a candid explication of what their thought process is. And in Jackson's opinions, you really feel that you are talking to somebody. And that's a great gift, um, both to, to be able to do that, but also it's a great gift for people who read it because it gives you an insight into how somebody genuinely thinks through the problems and how they grapple with them. When you, when you came to the court uh, as a clerk for Brennan, Jackson have a jurisprudence which sort of uh, you, you could identify and touch? Not as clearly as, say, a Douglas or a Frankfurter or a Black, because Jackson was more pragmatic as a justice. Um, he did not, for the most part, speak in sweeping generalities. He was more interested in the details of individual cases. So where you could identify clear judicial philosophies to some justices, like Douglas Black, Frankfurter. Um, I think it was less clear with Jackson that you could pigeonhole him in that way. Um, he was more of a judge's judge in the sense of, you had the sense that you, each case engaged him, and he thought hard about the merits of each case. And the virtue of that is that he's behaving in the way that the sort of idealized judge behaves. The disadvantage is you're less likely to leave a sort of simple catchphrase legacy of, um, you know, the First Amendment's an absolute. Uh, Jackson didn't really have absolutes in that way. Uh, is, the, is the Jackson jurisprudence, do you guess, is there a, a sense of that at all on the, on the court? Um, Oh, yeah. From your perspective? Well, in, in the Hamdan case, the case that came down uh, in June that, um, that shot down the military commissions that the Bush administration wanted to use to try the Guantanamo detainees, um, 
Justice Kennedy's concurring opinion cites Youngstown, you know, extensively mm -hmm. to say, um, I guess he says, you know, this is category three where Congress has given, set up a system and this is not that. Not only has Congress not authorized this, it's not just a question of congressional silence, but Congress has set up a system for trials of enemy combatants and it's not this system and so this has to fall. Um, so yeah, I think um, Justice Jackson's legacy is very much alive and of course uh, Chief Justice Roberts uh, who clerked for Chief Justice Rehnquist, who clerked for Justice Jackson, I think sees himself um, in, that, in that line of dissent um, and Jackson's name came up during the confirmation hearings. Uh, for Roberts, and so, um, yeah, that's living history, very definitely. Are you on John Barrett's mailing list? I am. <laughs> During that confirmation hearing, he was very good at cataloging. Yes. Uh, 14 times, in case you want. Was it 14? I don't think I counted full 14, but yes, I did. In fact, I wrote, uh, yeah, I wrote a little, um, a little sidebar during the confirmation hearings making a Jackson connection. I have done, particularly since I became Solicitor General and thereafter, have done an enormous amount of thinking about Robert Jackson and who he was for a variety of reasons that we can talk about. But, you know, one thing that always impressed me about Jackson was reading some of his reflections and speeches about the role of the lawyer. And uh, he gave in particular one talk about, after he had become a justice, about what constitutes good oral advocacy. And you probably know this quote very well, but I use it all the time about the, you know, the parable about the three uh, workers who are, you know, cutting stones for a cathedral. And what the response of each of the three of them is. And that's the metaphor that I have in my mind as a lawyer. I want... For the tape, why don't you go through that? Well, uh, I don't have Justice Jackson's words in front of me, but he, what he, he was reflecting on um, oral advocacy and lawyers' advocacy and said that, you know, as now as a Supreme Court justice, you know, as he watched the progression of lawyers coming to argue their cases in front of the Supreme Court, he was reminded of the parable uh, of the stonecutters. And, you know, one, a visitor to the outskirts of a, you know, a stonecutting operation said to, came up to one stonecutter and said, you know, what are you doing? And the stonecutter said, um, I'm earning my daily bread. And he went to the second stone cutter and said, you know, what are you doing? Hi. Good morning. And said, um, what are you doing? And the second stone cutter said, I'm shaping my stones to, my pieces of stone to fit in the building. And the third one said, lifted up his eyes and said, I'm building a cathedral. And what Justice Jackson said is, it lifts the heart of a judge to have a lawyer appear in front of the court who understands that he is building a cathedral. And that's the way I think that, that's my professional ambition to, you, can all, you will always fall short, but to try and build a professional cathedral for every case that you handle. Um, I mean, in terms of broader aspirations, that gets into sort of deep life questions about um, work-life balance and how much of one's professional life to devote to private clients versus pro bono matters and teaching and civic responsibilities, which is always in, in flux and ought to be something that people, particularly people who are in professions that are so jealously demanding of their time, mm -hmm. like the practice of law, should think about. Well, William Rehnquist was really great at the job of being Chief Justice of the United States. By that I mean the technical aspects of the job 
running the Supreme Court, being responsible for the American judiciary as a whole, uh, he was terrific. He really learned from, frankly, Warren Burger's negative example, mm -hmm. who was not popular among his colleagues. And Rehnquist was truly beloved among uh, his colleagues across the political spectrum. On the substance of his views, he was very conservative, and he didn't win as much as he'd hoped and as much as you might have expected him to hope. We might have expected him to win. Mm -hmm. But you know, his, his victories may come on, on those issues after his death. O'Connor. Well, O'Connor, I think, is really one of the large figures in American history, clearly the most influential woman in American history, and right up there uh, among men. Uh, I, I think she um, had a politician's instinct for where the American people were on the most contentious issues of the day. And that was really where she wanted to steer the court. She was a moderate by temperament, by inclination, by politics. And I think that is uh, where she tried to keep the court. Stevens. Justin Stevens is, I have to say, even to me, a rather mysterious figure. Uh, not, um, not much of a public figure at all. Speaks in public rarely not a conventional liberal, although now votes on the liberal side most of the time, but a quirky intellect, probably the finest lawyer on the court, uh, but someone who has always just gone his own way and been very self-confident about it. Scalia. Um, uh, Scalia is a larger-than-life figure, bombastic, uh, intentionally outrageous at times, and someone who, through many, many years on the court, I think sacrificed some influence for all of his pizzazz, uh, sometimes alienating colleagues. I think the Heller decision on gun control is really the first very important majority opinion that Scalia has written but I think is an illustration of, of how late in his career his influence is only rising. Thomas. Well, Thomas is the most complicated and tortured figure on the court. He is um, still deeply obsessed and hurt by the experience of his confirmation hearings. He is by far the most conservative member of the court, well to the right of Scalia and someone who is a paradox because he is beloved among his colleagues, beloved by the people who work at the court, various, very fun, yet at the same time seething with anger. Well, certainly today, certainly today Anthony Kennedy is the most important Supreme Court Justice because he holds in his hand the outcome of case after case. He is the swing justice like there's never been a swing justice. He is someone who is conservative on most issues, on civil rights, on voting rights, but on a couple of issues where, at least I think, he was deeply influenced by all his travels abroad, like the death penalty and the Geneva Conventions, there he tends to side with the liberals. Ginsburg. Ginsburg is one of the few lawyers to serve on the history of the Supreme Court who would be a major figure in American law if she'd never served on the court. Mm -hmm. Thurgood Marshall being the other prominent example because she really created um, the field of sex discrimination law in the Supreme Court and argued many cases, most of them successfully. She has had the not so good fortune to be on the court at a time when her views have not been in ascendance. So, uh, she's had to write some dissenting opinions in cases that she cared about, but a very important lawyer in our history. Breyer. Breyer is, Breyer is the sunniest Supreme Court justice. He is, I think, the most approachable, the most uh, relaxed. He's also someone who uh, really believes in American government, in the institutions of our government. He. Uh, really does, you know, is very proud of the fact that he worked in the Congress. He's the only member 
of the Supreme Court now who spend any significant time working in Congress. He's the only Supreme Court justice who, without fail, goes to the State of the Union address each year mm -hmm. because he feels that th the Supreme Court is part of government and should show that to the public. And the guy that often gets confused with Breyer or the vice versa is Souter. Well, David Souter, it, it is just an absolute miracle that this man is on the Supreme Court because he's so unlikely to be there. You know, the, the court tends to get people who've been self-promoters, who have uh, really tried hard to become prominent in the profession. And David Souter leads this very peculiar 19th century lifestyle. But in terms of pure intellectual firepower, is probably second only to Stevens on that court in terms of his just understanding of the law uh, and He's just a, a peculiar individual, but a very, very good lawyer. Roberts. I, I think it's, it sometimes seemed that John Roberts was genetically programmed to be Chief Justice of the United States. He is so perfect in the role, his charm, his intelligence, his grace as a public person. All of that is perfect for the role. He is also very, very conservative, and it will be interesting to see if which part of those sides of his character become his legacy, because he wants to take the law in some very controversial directions, and we'll see if he has the votes to do it. Alito. Alito is somewhat like David Souter in his shyness, his unlikelihood, uh, in, in how unlikely it is that he wound up on the Supreme Court because he's not a self-promoter. He's not someone uh, who has burned with ambition his whole life to be on the Supreme Court. Very competent, very intelligent, very experienced, and very conservative. Questions since we're in the Robert Jackson Center. Is there a sense of Robert Jackson with Jeff Tubin? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, I mean, I'm going to talk about this some tomorrow, but uh, I mean, my immediate association with Robert Jackson is that he was the best writer ever to be on the Supreme Court. You know, put aside the substance of his views, which was interesting, put aside his, the, the remarkable life that he led, just as a writer, the, as a stylist, as a creator of sentences, there was no one better on the court. And uh, that's, that's what I think of him above all. Similarly, as you, was there any sense of that from your sources uh, as you were preparing for this and, and there, some of these folks, their ability to, to write, did, was, was that a, a, a sense of jurisprudence? Or well, I, I, think, I think one of the things the court has lost in recent years, because the opinions are so long and bureaucratic, is the voice of the individual justice. That when the days when the justices did most of their own first drafts, you often had a sense of the individual through their writing. It is more homogenized now, and I think uh, that that's a loss at the court. And Jackson is the classic example of a justice who, even though he did not serve that long on the court, made a, a historical reputation for himself, not just for the quality of his thought, but the quality of his sentences. Jeff Tobin, thank you very much. Great to be here. What does Robert H. Jackson mean to, what did that mean to you at the time, if, if, if anything? Was, it, was, he, was that a presence? Well, sure. I mean, it's physically a presence, at least for most of the time I was there, and that his portrait um, hanged in, hung in the uh, SG's office. Um, and, you know, it actually hung in the uh, sort of the external formal part of the office over the fireplace, so it had, uh, it had pride of place. Um, and, you know, there, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, I think one is that, uh, you know, there are only so many solicitors general who went on to become attorney general, and it would be natural uh, in the SG's office to have somebody who went in, in, on and did that because, uh, you know, you, you have portraits of attorneys general, not there are no formal portraits, painted portraits of solicitors general. 
Um, if there were, I mean, Jackson's portrait would be there too. But I'm just saying this sort of limits the universe of potential people for whom it would make a great deal of sense to have their portrait uh, hanging in uh, in the SG's office. But uh, but there there were other candidates, Francis Biddle, for for example. Um, now Jackson has two advantages over over Biddle. One, he certainly was a, a more handsome man. Um, so you know, to the extent that <laughs> aesthetics matter here, uh, you know, the, I checked out the Biddle portrait and. I wasn't I wasn't that excited about it, um, but I mean, there's also the, the the much more serious and obvious point that you know Jackson's reputation as solicitor general, as attorney general, as a justice, as the Nuremberg prosecutor. I mean, all of that together makes him you know I think an inspiration for um, you know all sorts of lawyers in the department, mm -hmm. not the least of which um, in the SG's office. And not only does his attorney general portrait hang or hung for most of the time uh, I was there, uh, as I was uh, mentioning, uh, you know, I, I lost him at the end of uh, my service to uh, Attorney General McKaysey, and it's hard to de deny an Attorney General from New York, uh, an Attorney General from New York's uh, portrait, but, uh, but in addition to his Attorney General portrait, um, there are photographic uh, portraits of all the Solicitors General, um, and his portrait there hangs in a place of honor in the SG's conference room, along with the, uh, I think, three other solicitors general who went on to serve as justices of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, kind of any way you look at it, whether as an advocate um, or as uh, as a justice, I mean, there's there's sort of obvious reasons why uh, Justice Jackson is held in such high regard uh, by the lawyers in the SG. What I learned about Jackson in the context of the court fight is, is just how much Roosevelt really trusted Jackson's advice. Mm -hmm. Jackson was not a major player in, in this conflict, um, but he's present and he's got a significant role at the Justice Department, obviously, during this period. But more importantly, he's got a relationship that goes way back with Franklin Roosevelt. And so uh, he finds himself almost zealot like in the Oval Office at key moments. He's there in the Oval Office when Roosevelt gets the call from Don Richburg over at the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court has just overturned the NRA and the Schechter decision. And Jackson is there with him in the Oval Office in that, in that moment, which he writes about in, in uh, his memoir, In That Man. And uh, so Jackson's in a position whenever asked or whenever there to offer Roosevelt advice. Uh, on these sorts of questions. And uh, while he was not driving certainly Roosevelt's policy in, in this area, he has nothing to do with the court packing plan. Uh, he is there for Roosevelt to, to reach out to uh, at, at key moments. And I think the most important advice that Jackson gives Roosevelt in this regard during this period happens right after the launch of the court fight when Jackson in February 1937 comes back to Jamestown and spends some time talking to folks in town who he expects would be the president's natural supporters on the court plan and he finds that the, the, that the folks in Jamestown are in Jackson's words baffled by the court plan that the president hasn't done enough to prepare them for what he wanted to do with the, with the Supreme Court and uh, he's, he's not doing enough to persuade them. And so Jackson writes a very frank letter to FDR. And I spent a lot of time in FDR's correspondence. And I'll tell you, um, Roosevelt, particularly in February 1937, really didn't receive anything like this. It was just a very frank letter to the president that Jackson composes when he goes back to Washington and says, I've spent some time among the plain people, as Jackson puts it. And he says, your argument isn't convincing anybody. And you're actually losing ground instead of gaining ground. And he pushes the president to be very direct about his purposes in packing the court, to really take on the court rather than to do it by indirection as Roosevelt did and pretend that the whole thing is a matter of judicial efficiency, to say this is about ideology, this is about a conservative Supreme Court that is standing in the way of the New Deal. You should tell people that. And Roosevelt finally says, you know what, that's a good idea. And there's, a ro there's an Oval Office meeting that follows that letter very shortly where Jackson and Reed are visiting with the president, and they continue on this line, and Roosevelt yields almost immediately and says, you're right. Um, I've wasted a few weeks um, pursuing this other rationale. I've got to be straight with the people about it. And Roosevelt begins work on two very important speeches in March of 1937 that really lay out the case as 
Jackson thought that he should. Well, let me back up. The Struggle for Judicial Supremacy book, which came out 1941. 41. Why did Why did Jackson feel compelled to write that book? Was that part of that experience? Well, he 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 certainly. Um, I'll just take a step back to Jackson's role in in the remainder of the court fight. There were a couple of key points where Jackson made strong public statements on behalf of the court packing plan. He was no great fan of court packing itself. It is probably not what Jackson would have chosen to do, but he did believe that the court needed to act with restraint. This was a common theme of Jackson's, which he develops uh, very uh, fully in, in the struggle for judicial supremacy, and you can see it in his work on the, on the Supreme Court, obviously. Um, but Jackson, um, again, acting on his own advice, felt that he needed to make the case directly for the president's purposes. And Homer Cummings, when the, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee held hearings on the court packing bill beginning in March 1937, and the first witness that they called on behalf of the administration was Homer Cummings, the Attorney General. And Cummings gave a very smooth presentation, but he argued almost entirely on the grounds that the court was inefficient and needed help with its work and so therefore it needed new justices and this this case had been battered for a month and it was rather remarkable to many people that Cummings was willing to make that argument again. Mm -hmm. Jackson tried to correct the error a day later when he gave testimony and he made the case as he urged Roosevelt to make it and indeed as Roosevelt himself had begun to make it which is to say that this was a conservative court that was out of step with the will of the people, uh, that it was acting on not constitutional grounds but on the basis of its own economic predilections, and that it needed to step back and allow the will of the people to assert itself through this legislation, which in his view was perfectly constitutional. And so the general view was that Jackson gave the most effective presentation on behalf of the court bill and he won a lot of praise for it even from those who didn't support the court bill. It was such a masterful, lawyerly, clean presentation in contrast to Cummings' smooth and sort of disingenuous presentation. So that was an important contribution that, that, that uh, Jackson himself made uh, to the president's case over the course of that. He also gave a speech, at, at a couple of speeches in late March, uh, in which he suggested that uh, there would be greater labor strife in the country if uh, the, the court um, was going to stand in the way of, of the, the Wagner Labor Act, the National Labor Relations Act, and um, saw this as, again, a justification to uh, pass the president's plan. So uh, Jackson became an important public advocate for the plan, even if it was limited essentially to those mm -hmm. couple of appearances. Um, he, he was very helpful to the president in that way. He did go to some pains to, to make clear to people that he was not, as it had been reported, a member of the president's team that plotted strategy. He was often, um, there, there was a, a group that was informally known as the President's Strategy Board, which was being run during the court fight by the President's son, James Roosevelt, and consisted of Tommy Corcoran and a few other individuals. And it was often reported that Robert Jackson was on the Strategy Board, and there was some confusion about that. Uh, and Jackson wanted it known that he was not actually in this little group uh, who was uh, who's organizing uh, uh, the, 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 the political strategy uh, for passing the bill. Um, but he was involved and I think there was some question in subsequent years, not only on Frankfurter's part but on others' part, whether there, there would be a taint associated with this since after all it was a failed undertaking. At the same time, uh, many people had come to feel by that point that it was a successful undertaking. Roosevelt always said in later years, we lost the battle, but we won the war. He'd lost the battle to pack the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court had changed. The switch in time that saved nine. Suddenly the Supreme Court that had been striking down all the New Deal programs was now upholding the New Deal programs. And, and he and others uh, around him, and uh, I can't speak to Jackson's personal view on this, but I think uh, 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 a good many uh, of Roosevelt's, uh, members of Roosevelt's inner circle believed that Roosevelt had essentially forced the change. He had put enough pressure on the court that Owen Roberts, the swing justice, had swung. And uh, I, I'd be surprised if Jackson himself wasn't of that view, uh, particularly given what he wrote in 
the struggle. Did Jack, do you get a sense that, that Jackson at that time was positioning himself to be a justice of the Supreme Court? I think that it was certainly in the air. In fact, it was not only in the air, but it was in the press. Uh, at the beginning of the court, it, it, it's hard for us to to see this because it, the, the court plan was such a spectacular failure that it does seem, looking back, that the handwriting was on the wall from the beginning. In fact, as I try to make clear in Supreme Power, it seemed to most observers at the beginning, and actually for some time after that, that Roosevelt ultimately would win. He would win ugly, but he would get what he wanted. And so there was speculation from the very beginning, uh, in March 19, beginning in February 1937, Who's Roosevelt going to name? He's not only going to get to name one new justice, he's going to get to name six new justices. Mm -hmm. uh, and so who are they? And a lot of names were floated. And one of the remarkable uh, ironies of all this is that a good number of these folks actually wound up being named to the court, not in the wake of court packing, um, uh, but uh, over the succeeding years. So Jackson's name was mentioned in the papers uh, as one possibility, uh, Felix Frankfurter, uh, William Douglas and a number of others who didn't actually wind up on the court in the end. Uh, but Jackson's name was in the air and I'm, I'm sure this was not uh, outside the reach of his ambitions. Uh, and I think that this was another area where Jackson was demonstrating his, uh, his, his shrewd legal judgment and also his service to the president. Robert Jackson. Jackson. Well, so a couple of things about Jackson. You and I talked a little bit about, you know, I've, I've done nothing but write about torture mm -hmm. for the last 10 years and attempting to answer for America's complete unwillingness to take responsibility for what it did. And, you know, I've been, I was an early advocate for a truth commission or for a special prosecutor or for something to t signal to the world that we take as seriously what Jackson did at Nuremberg when it's we ourselves who are the perpetrators. And so, I, you know, I always feel like I'm triangulating back to Nuremberg when we talk about horrific injustice being done people saying they were just following orders, people saying we were working under impossible conditions, people saying it was just the law and the law made it legal. Those are all things that I always map back onto Nuremberg. And I guess, you know, one thing I've thought about a lot as it's become very clear in the last two years, there will never be accountability for what we did wrong in the war on terror. There will never be a moment in which America takes responsibility for making bad choices. Uh, and, the, and the ethos, and this is, I, for this I blame the Obama administration, that, oh, you know, to, to stir all that up will just to create, be to create more politics and to, 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 to go through point by point who did what, you know, can't we just move on, right? That Obama's locution is just turn the page and get over it. And, I guess I think that Robert Jackson would have been the last person who would turn the page and say, we'll just get over it. There can be no closure without resolving it. Um, you know, we always go back to Jackson, the concurrence in Youngstown, for these foundational ideas about executive power. I mean, how could one person get it so right, you know, and intuitively get it right in a way that would kind of continue to be what shapes the way we think about Guantanamo and renditions and everything else. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say about Jackson was something that I've been so aware of is that we have nine justices who went to two schools mm -hmm. and all their clerks went to five schools and they all came up through the executive branch and then through the federal judiciary and not one of them, I mean I think there's only one on the current bench, that's Ginsburg, who was any kind of civil rights lawyer, one, uh, almost none who have tried cases. Uh, I think that the part of what is so impoverished at the court 
is experience, is having been in the world and tried cases and litigated like piddly little things that were too insignificant to matter to other people. Uh, and to marry that to Jackson's just incredible political savvy. Mm -hmm. And those two qualities, you know, I, I think O'Connor represented the last of real political savvy at the court. That's mm -hmm. gone. Now, I think Kagan has some of it. We'll see. But certainly it's not from having a lot of political experience. If she has it, she intuits it. Um, but that being in the trenches, that quality of having lived life and been with people, I, I always tell the story because to me I think it speaks volumes of the Greyhound bus search case a few years ago at the court where they were trying to determine whether riders on a Greyhound bus had a reasonable expectation of privacy and the bags over their heads. And you're watching nine justices who have clearly never been on a Greyhound bus in their lives. If they've been on a Greyhound bus, it was 50 years ago. Uh, but if you had said to any of the nine of them, where's the Greyhound terminal in Washington, D.C.? I don't know that they could have found it. And it made me so aware of how much your life as lived inflects upon the way you do law. And I think that for me, Jackson really represents a life fully lived in a million different ways, uh, exposure to so many kinds of people. And I, it's not to in any way impugn the brilliance of the nine justices we have. No one doubts that they're brilliant. But I, I, I think we need justices who are out in the world and who tried cases <laughs> and who fought for civil liberties and who uh, really got dirty. Uh, because I think what's missing at the court, and I think one of the things Jackson brought to the court, was that always having a sense of what was going on out in the world. Do you guys ever have any reason to talk about that? Well, yes. So I, I think it would have been Justice Blackman's it might have been his 80th birthday, but it was one of his big birthdays. We were having a clerk's reunion, and as you know, in Flood Against Kuhn, which is the baseball antitrust case, there's this um, kind of passage at the beginning of it that's a list of famous baseball players, and it goes on and on. And apparently he started out with about 10 of them, then various people around the building would suggest people, and then somebody said, well, but if you're going to include, you know, if you're going to include Tinkers, you have to include Evers. Oh, if you're going to include Evers, you have to include Chance. And so they just, that list kind of mm -hmm. expanded and expanded. And there was a story in The Brethren that um, right after the opinion came down, somebody said to him, how could you not include Jimmy Fox? And he said, Jimmy Fox was on the list. And the person said, no, he's not. And the justice went back and looked at the list, and sure enough, Jimmy Fox is not on the list. And the line in The um, Brethren is something like, and Justice Biden said, I'll never forgive myself. So <laughs> for his, for his, um, for his uh, 80th birthday, I think it was his 80th, we decided we were going to get him one of Jimmy Fox's bats. Uh. And we looked into it, and we could not find one. But it turns out that Hellrich and Bradley, I think that's what the Louisville Slugger Company's name is, they keep the measurements of every player on file for their bats. And so we went to them, and we had them replicate um, one of Jimmy Fox's bats, and we had it mounted on a plaque, and on the bottom it just said, I will never forgive myself, H-A-B, <laughs> and we gave it to him, the clerks all gave it to him for uh, uh, his, um, his, his birthday. Um, and I saw it actually posted in his chambers the day he died, uh, after his funeral, we all went back to the chambers to hang out, and there was the bat, which I think was, several people asked for it, but I think it was given to the Library of Congress. And the other thing about baseball that I, is he had been a friend of the Griffiths, who owned the, uh, then the Minneapolis Millers, mm -hmm. later the, the Twins. Um, and so we would talk about baseball a lot at, um, at breakfast. And um, uh, one day in the afternoon, he, we, I was in the upstairs chambers and I got a phone call, you should come down. The justice has somebody he wants you to meet. And this group called the Emil Verbin Society was having its reunion in Washington, I, I guess it's a Cubs yep. uh, thing. And so um, I, there were these, three guys in like bad fitting sports coats in his office and, and he introduced them to me and two of them I don't remember the names because I'm not a Cubs fan at all but the last one was Andy Pafka who had been a Dodger as well and so I had a nice conversation one afternoon with uh, Andy Pafko 
Um, and the last baseball thing I'll tell you is when um, Justice Blackman retired from the Supreme Court, I was asked to do one of the tributes for him in the Harvard Law Review. And uh, one of the things I talked about um, in the, um, in the um, tribute was this uh, article that had been written called Your Law Baseball Quiz. I think I told you about this last night where they compare uh, different justices to different um, uh, famous baseball players. And I said that, you know, and so I tell the story of, you know, Jackie Jensen is like Byron White because they were both better at football. And, um, and then I say, you know, and they, he compared, the guy who did this compared um, Felix Frankfurter to, among other things, Wayne Terwilliger. And, I, and, I, and in the article, I just had a footnote, I said, who is Wayne Terwilliger? Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, and then ultimately I said that if I had to pick somebody for Justice Blackman to be like, I had thought originally about Bobby Brown because Justice Blackman wanted to be a doctor just like Bobby Brown became a doctor and that I thought of, you know, um, a couple of other people like that, you know, Charlie Geringer because he was a little tiny, you know, um, a little tiny second baseman and, you know, a great fielder but not not a big batter, and ultimately I came out with Dave Winfield, which people might not have guessed, because both of them sure. came from St. Paul and made something of themselves. Both of them played the game long after many of their contemporaries had retired, and both of them owed their start to a convicted but later pardoned Watergate felon. Uh, to, to a later, I'm sorry, to a later pardoned Watergate felon, because um, uh, Blackman got his seat on the Supreme Court from Nixon, and um, uh, George Steinbrenner is the person who gave Dave Winfield his biggest contract. Um, <laughs> and so terrific. when I so, yeah, so I read this and I went and I, you know and the next time I visited the justice, the justice said, "Oh, I really liked your um, your tribute a lot, but come with me." And he led me down the hall into the storeroom. He was then down at the Thurgood Marshall Center, and he pulled out a copy of the Baseball Encyclopedia, and he said, "This is Wayne Terwilliger," <laughs> and took me to the page for Wayne Terwilliger. Twig. <laughs> I'd never heard of him. And I'm a baseball fan, and I'd never heard of him. Should baseball retain its antitrust exemption? Well, you know, I'm a big Bill James fan, and Bill James has a discussion of this where he says that if you got rid of the antitrust exemption, what you might start to see is a kind of proliferation of a third or fourth uh, major league almost coming out of minor league teams. Um, I'm not sure what function the antitrust exemption really performs today, given that there's now an agreement between the players' association and the teams, right? Um, you know, and the, and a huge percentage ever since free agency, a huge percentage of the revenue has moved over to the players. I'm not sure that the existing players would favor getting rid of the antitrust exemption. Such an anachronism. Yeah, yeah, but hard to see that it's actually having much effect on, on the game itself. Um, and the real question is how you maintain competitive balance. Right? Mm -hmm. If you, if you want to maintain the sport, the real question is how to maintain competitive balance. And without the antitrust exemption, it might be harder. Right? Did you ever talk about Roe versus Wade, you guys? Yeah. Um, so the first time he talked about Roe versus Wade is when I went to interview with him. Um, he had a, Justice Blackman had been a tax lawyer mm -hmm. before he was then counsel at the Mayo Clinic. And he had exactly the habits you would expect from somebody who had been a very good tax lawyer. He was like incredibly meticulous and precise. And so when he interviewed people, he had this long list of questions written out. And he asked you the questions, then he wrote down the answers in pencil. And towards the end of the interview, he said, now I want to ask you a question, and I want you to think about this very carefully. Uh, and, so I was there. and then he said, now, I've written an opinion that's a little bit controversial, and some people find it the kind of opinion that they have trouble with, and um, you need to think about whether you would be comfortable working for me given the opinion. And I'm sort of racking my brain to think, like, what opinion is he talking about? Um, and he said, you may have heard of it. And now I'm thinking, okay, what is he going to say? He said, it's called Roe against Wade. And you know, I'm a little bit of a kind of smart ass sometimes, and all I could think is just don't say, oh my God, you're that Harry Blackman? You're kidding. <laughs> um, but he actually had had a clerk apparently several years before who had, in the middle of the year, uh, had a religious revelation that Roe was wrong and it had been for an awkward year. So that was the first time that I had a conversation with him. We had 
two abortion cases my year at the Supreme Court, and it was actually the kind of high watermark of abortion rights at the Supreme Court was one of those cases, a case called Thornburg against American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists, which the justice wrote. Um, and so we had a fair number of conversations about abortion, and he was convinced that, you know, that was also the first time that it was five to four mm -hmm. to uphold the kind of central premise of Roe because the Chief Justice switched side. So we talked about a lot then, and then um, as you probably know, he used to teach at the Aspen Institute in the summer, uh, a justice and society class, and he spent a day of that talking about the decision process leading up to Roe, and I was there one year, and he, he talked about that there. What did he say? Well, he taught, I mean, it, it's interesting. I think, although he wouldn't, I think he wouldn't put it quite this way. His thoughts about Roe evolved somewhat over time. Because when he started on the case, his major, um, you know, the major focus for him was the practice of medicine. Because he had come out of being counsel at the Mayo Clinic, and he took very seriously the idea that this was a medical procedure, and therefore it was up to women in consultation with their doctors to make this decision in the way that would be true of all other medical procedures. I think over time he came to see Roe as equally about uh, women's autonomy, that it wasn't mostly about medical autonomy, it was about women's autonomy. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got there, I think he was thinking about it in much, those two things have, were much more an equipoise in being important to him. Um, but he just thought it was not the kind of decision that should be made categorically by the state as opposed to by individuals given the circumstances they found themselves in. Had Jane Rose publicly switched? No, no, no. I think, I think she had said by then that she regretted having had the abortion, but it wasn't until maybe about five years ago or so that she filed a sort of quorum nobis trying to get mm -hmm. Roe overturned. More importantly, Herbert Wexler. Ah, yeah, of course. Herbert Wexler, see, I, I only did two years there because I'd done two years of law at Oxford. <clears throat> and Herbert Wexler was my legal education. I came in <clears throat> and I had him for criminal law. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he was doing the model penal code. Uh -huh. I had him for constitutional law. And uh, at that time, he was about to give the neutral principle speech uh, at Harvard, the uh, Holmes Lecture. And I had him for the first half of federal courts. Jerry Gunther did the second half. So that was two and a half, two and a half full year courses with Herbert Wexler, who was, to my mind, the greatest legal scholar of his time. And a classroom teacher of consummate skill. And uh, he, he asked some softball question of the student. The student came up with some uh, grandiloquent answer. I offered you a scalpel for this problem, and you went after it with a shillelagh. <laughs> He was merciless, but wonderful, wonderful. And he was the reason that I got a clerkship with John Harlan, uh, okay. uh, he rec his recommendation. Elsie Douglas was working for uh, Justice Frankfurter, whose, off whose chambers were just around the corner from ours. Uh, and very often in those days, the justices had only two law clerks. Uh, now, uh, and the chief had three. Uh, but uh, everybody else had only two, except for Douglas, who had one, uh, but he had extra secretaries to write his books. We, we were quite close to the Frankfurter Chambers, more than uh, topographically, uh, because Frankfurter would often come in to see his friend John. Uh, he, he greatly admired Frank, uh, Harlan. Harlan was, in a way, something that uh, Frankfurter 
somehow aspired because he was this patrician uh, with uh, uh, whose grandfather had been on the Supreme Court and he believed in federalism as Frankfurter did and judicial restraint and they had similar views about, along with learned hand similar views about Brennan, Douglas, Warren and Black who were referred to as the Jesus Quartet uh, and uh, except uh, except Harlan could not be gotten to speak of them disparagingly. He would not, I mean, he was very correct. One instance, he gave a dinner every year. It was after Povey Ullman had come out where Frankfurt, uh, where Frankfurt had written the opinion and Harlan had dissented uh, from Frankfurter. Frankfurter hadn't really given a reason why this was not justiciable uh, and he had said that uh, this it may be difficult but it's not ineffable and Frankfurter and I were conversing and I used the word ineffable and he turned on me and he said oh give it a rest <laughs> I remember that today. Yeah. Once you've gotten into the into the rhythm of it, you welcome it. Mm -hmm. And I remember my argument where I was arguing Morrison v. Olson that the uh, Independent Counsel Act was unconstitutional. And I argued for 25 minutes, that's what I was allocated, I believe, uh, and I was interrupted once wow. by Justice Stevens. And I think out of pity. Uh, and I knew that was a terrible sign. It means that they had their minds made up and they didn't want to tip their hands. The, the courtroom was packed and packed with politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want to tip their hand. Uh, they, uh, so no questions were asked. And I knew, uh, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is over. So you, you welcome the questions. Uh, and to, uh, you hope you get enough time to give an answer, but uh, no, the, the questions are very important because after all, uh, as I learned, as I taught myself, it's not a professor with nine students, it's nine students, nine professors with one student. <laughs> <laughs> and you, so you, you welcome the occasion to learn what's on their minds. The decision rolls out. How do, do your eyes sort of glaze over? They hand it to you. You've been waiting. There it is. You've got the piece of paper. Do you go right to the last page? Uh, the one I remember better than anything is, Mar again, Morrison v. Olson, mm -hmm. uh, which I really felt I deserved to win, and which I'm sure if it had not been Morrison v. Olson, but Clinton against Starr, I would have won. Uh, well, I heard the opinion. It was uh, seven to one. Kennedy had not had not taken a seat yet, so he was not uh, in the one dissent, and it was magnificent. Was uh, Scalia's, and I walked out. And I went into the Solicitor General's room and I called my dentist who said there was a teeth he, tooth he needed to pull. And I asked him, do you suppose you could do it this morning? <laughs> <laughs> that was, so I thought I'd get it all over in one day. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were very similar in that they were both uh, not, uh, they were not uh, school taught. They were self-taught, uh, and uh, so they, obviously what you have is an inherent gift, both of them, and then they both had the same, uh, the same gift to, uh, in a very concise uh, phrase. You know, the Gettysburg, Gettysburg uh, Lincoln's address was preceded by one by 
I forget who, but he spoke for three hours. Uh, you know, and that was that was part of Lincoln's genius. Yes. And uh, Jackson similarly was not long-winded. What was it that was a style that made you conclude that uh, you know right up there with Justices Marshall and Holmes that? Uh, well, his uh, his ability to capture in a phrase that was not yet a cliche but was so good that it, like much of Shakespeare, <clears throat> it would become one uh, to capture an idea in a phrase. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the remarkable, uh, that was the remarkable thing. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, we, I'm going to mention that uh, today in my lecture uh, on original intent as uh, mysterious as the dreams that Joseph was called to uh, uh, interpret for Pharaoh. Uh, is what, and the, each side gets more or less apt quotations which more or less cancel each other out. Well, there's no fancy language there. It's just unforgettable and punctures forever mm -hmm. the whole uh, originalist pretension. And of course, this famous, uh, this, you can't improve on, uh, I think it was in Brown v. Allen, we are not uh, final because we are infallible, we are infallible because we are final. There's not a fancy word in that, mm -hmm. but Never again can anyone have a contrary pretension. <laughs>a lovely, lovely person, though. Did, did you know that was coming? Did they give an advance? No, no, not at all. And uh, I think happily for the Republic, he, he didn't really stand a great chance of ever being elected. But as I said, I do think he's a very thoughtful and um, a person. But, um, but that, was, I think, it was just a moment of exuberance, over-exuberance on his part. What does a Robert Jackson mean to a Professor Amar? Um, he's this very interesting transitional figure. Um, he himself um, was not a law clerk, but um, his, um, his, his own law clerks, uh, 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 but he did have law clerks, and one of them became Chief Justice, and, and one of that, uh, William Rehnquist, and one of that person's um, law clerks again became Chief Justice, John Roberts. So he's this very interesting transitional figure. He emerged from a world in which you didn't have to have gone to a fancy law school. You didn't have to have clerked to be on the Supreme Court. Um, uh, but um, today, many of the people who are on the Supreme Court or have been on the Supreme Court since Jackson have gone to fancy law schools and have done fancy clerkships. And interestingly, they have connections to Robert Jackson. Like William Rehnquist went to Stanford Law School and was his own, was Jackson's own clerk, or like John Roberts, who went to Harvard Law School and who clerked for Rehnquist, who, to repeat, in turn, clerked for Jackson. Uh, when you were at Yale, did Jackson, be, was he much read, was he a conversation or, uh, uh, or not? I mean, uh, do you have a, re a recollection that uh, you have the Frankfurters, the Blacks, the Douglases? Uh, was Jackson in that conversation? My colleague Bruce Ackerman um, has paid great attention to um, uh, Jackson's uh, uh, work even before he was a justice, to his his critique of the old court. He wrote a book about uh, judicial supremacy that Ackerman um, cites in great detail. I personally have found uh, John Barrett's work so fascinating on Jackson um, and uh, uh, my student uh, and friend Noah Feldman wrote a very interesting book about um, the Jackson era on the Supreme Court. Um, I um, read, have read a lot of work of, of Dennis Hutchinson and others about um, uh, that court. Um, by acclamation, I think uh, Jackson does rank among the uh, justices generally reckoned uh, uh, great. 
um, and um, there was a recent um, uh, list just last month by Cass Sunstein, who is among the, I think the, I think he may even be the single most cited uh, legal academic. I think he probably is the single most cited legal academic today. And he came up with his list of the the eight greatest justices of all time, and Jackson was on that list. Uh, and See, Cass is a Harvard Law product himself. I think four of the eight were Harvard Law School graduates. Uh, Holmes, Brandeis, Brennan, um, and Frankfurter. Um, and so the only four who weren't, uh, so four uh, were Harvard people. Earl Warren was a fifth, and uh, John Marshall was a sixth. So that only leaves two, you know, non-Harvard, non-Earl Warren, uh, non-chiefs um, uh, that it could be, uh, actually. And the other one was... A, a chief, um, William Rehnquist. So, so four were Harvard, three were chiefs. Jackson from the get-go isn't Harvard Law School and isn't a chief, so he got the only slot that wasn't Harvard and wasn't a chief in Cass Sunstein's list. So can't do much better than that. Thank you. Thank you very much.